four o'clock panel on big data. Um, my name is Yolanda Skiles. I'm counsel at Orrick Harrington. I'm resident in the Washington, D.C. office by way of Silicon Valley, born and bred. Um, happy to be back at Stanford and sit in the seat that um, the professor used to sit in, so it's all good. <laughs> to my right, I have the lovely Michelle. She needs no last name. Um, you probably know Michelle very well. Um, she has spoken at this conference quite a few times. Um, she is 11. 11. Really? I think so. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Yep. So she's spoken at every single Stanford e-commerce session. Um, she serves as McAfee's VP and Chief Privacy Officer. Um, she's done a lot of great things before McAfee. Um, she started the Identity Project, and that's a little play on words. Identity, identity. Um, is her last name, uh, a public service organization to address privacy needs in sensitive populations such as children and the elderly. Um, and so her website is theidentityproject.com. You should check it out. Um, and let's see, she had an illustrious career before then at Oracle where she did um, sales, was head of sales for Oracle's uh, new privacy products uh, solutions division. And before then she was at uh, Sun Microsystems their chief data governance officer within the cloud computing division. Um, so is there anything else I can say about you without embarrassing you? No, we can move <laughs> on. Get to the smart guy. Okay, I, our other guest um, is uh, Colin Rooney. Um, he is at the law firm of Arthur, Arthur Cox Solicitors. Um, he put in parentheses, Irish lawyers. Uh, for those who don't know, like me. But anyway, <laughs> anyway but um, Colin has a wealth of information that he can share with us. He's a partner in the technology group at Arthur Cox. Um, he advises on data protection and privacy, information technology, outsourcing, cloud computing, IP, and e-business matters. And uh, he has several clients who might be in the room today. So we are going to sort of cover a number of topics, but we hope that this can be interactive, just because your cookie needs to go with some discussion. So, um, so hopefully the sugar rush will, in, um, you know, encourage you to sort of participate uh, as if it's a senior seminar. We're going to skip over the easy stuff. We're going straight to the hard stuff, people. This is not going to be some also ran rehash of all the stuff you already know, because we already have that in book form, which we will plug very shortly. Um, so we will start first with um, the definition of big data and privacy. And when we were preparing for this conference, we actually had a little bit, I mean, we have some renegades on this panel, right? So the whole concept of whether privacy was the right term to use was debated. Um, so Michelle, would you like to lead us into that? All right, so big data. So how many in this room have advised their clients on big data matters already? A handful. How many of those were cloud issues? How many of those were just plentiful data, lots of data? How many of these were talking about Hadoop parallel processing off-prem? All right. So we How many of you people. thought that was a recipe for an atom bomb? <laughs> <laughs> so as you've seen by this display of hands, I think the term big data has become this kitchen sink term that we all use to just mean a lot. And then when you talk to your technical teams, they're talking about something often quite distinct and quite different. So I think there, it's really important, just as when cloud first surfaced as a name and stopped being the grid um, or .NET or other terms that, that meant um, ubiquitous computing and data center and data centric computing, big data has been kind of spread across the media, I think, in a very interesting way. When a computer scientist is really talking big data, they really are talking about parallel processing of very large data sets. Now, the interesting thing to the privacy practitioner is, in the old, olden days of about a year to six months ago, um, large data sets usually were considered metadata and were not included in the definition of personally identifiable data, necessarily. But now we have the ability to cache the data, to, to break it up, to split it, to create analytics that can point to an, a person or an identifiable person. And, and so they are inbound. So the first thing to do is we were talking about, you know, what would you say to your client when they, they have a big data problem is first you as the practitioner break it down into its parts. Are they talking about cloud computing? 
because that can be an on-prem, off-prem, hybrid data solution, a ubiquitous compute solution that can be absolutely distinct from using analytics that are derived from very, very large data sets that cannot be processed on-prem based on the basic size. Depend I mean, if you're Google, then they can, you can have big data on-prem. If you're most every other company, you probably don't have the data capacity to have supercomputers. And so you will be facing a situation where there will be a third party who will be in charge of that data. And so you will thus be in charge of all of the um, important issues if it's determined that um, the data sets can be put together in a way that identifies a person. Um, so I think that's thing number one. Probably still clear as mud. But the first thing you want to do is really break down, meet with your technical teams and your business teams, figure out which problem you're trying to solve when it comes to big data. Do you want to add? I think that makes perfect sense. I mean, what I just might add from a European perspective, I think, is if Michelle was to ask the same question to a European audience, almost everybody would put their hand up and say, yes, I've done big data. And that's because in Europe, everything gets conflated into data protection. Everything gets considered from a data protection perspective in the first instance. And that's a real challenge because Frequently, it's not a personal data issue. It's not the processing of personally identifiable information. Frequently, it is just processing of data. Um, and data confuses European lawyers. There are no rights around data in general. There are rights around confidential information. There's rights around databases. There's copyrights. And of course, there's personal data. So I think a key criterion is to establish, first of all, whether we're talking about personal data or whether we're talking about data which is outside of that context, whether because it's anonymized Ever been personal data. Once you've taken that step, I think we're into a good place to do the next stage of the analysis. And um, take us to that next stage. So let's well, say it's personal, personally identifiable well, and non. Okay, so assuming it's personally identifiable information in the first instance, I think what you're trying to do then is establish what you're doing with the information. So there's a key criterion um, of the data protection uh, regime, the current regime, as opposed to what is proposed and has been proposed and feels like it's been endlessly proposed over the last number of years. And that's purpose limitation. So what you've got to examine from a data protection perspective under the current regime is, um, is what I'm proposing to do within the context of what would have been considered reasonable by the person who supplied the information. Um, and that, that can be a challenge because you've got to ask yourself, well, A, did that person have a clear understanding of what was going to be done with the information at the time it was imparted? Or is this something which has grown over time and developed over time? There is some very good guidance. You would have heard Billy Hawks um, in one of the morning sessions talking about Article 29 working parties, uh, working party guidance. And that is very clear in terms of open data, big data, particularly when it's personally identifiable. It asks you about that purpose limitation, and it gives you some guidance in terms of what you need to do. As the current regime stands, in general, if there will be an impact on a data subject <coughs> arising from processing, and the processing is not something which would have been within their contemplation at the time they imparted the information, you probably need opt-in consent. Um, and that's a big ask. Um, and that is potentially more than when you would expect. It's certainly quite different to, I think, what you'd expect from a US perspective. Um, so that's, that, that's a fundamental change. Um, do you want me to do non-personal data as well, or? Well, sure. Well, since I'm gonna, yes. this is going to be a deposition style, because I have like five questions. But you sure, go ahead with the other piece. Yeah, well, I think the issue then around non-personal data is because quite... Because I think that's the tricky part. Yeah, right? That's it is. the hard case. And that's where, that's where the law in Europe has been largely ignored. So there's been a, a kind of recognition by the European Commission over the last number of years, since around about 2012, that actually they haven't paid much attention to this. So they ran a kind of consultation process called Licenses for Europe. And what that was trying to do was to say, well, hold on a minute. Is the copyright regime, is the database um, right, the sui, sui generis right, does that fit for purpose in terms of data mining activities, data analytics, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and they came to the conclusion that probably it wasn't. Um, but they haven't come up with an actual potential, act, you know, potential uh, applicable solution which delivers some sort of you know, realistic solution for uh, those data scientists, those who are engaged in analytics. Instead, what they've done is they've sort of said, yeah, we have a problem. Here's one option. We do some sort of you know, wholesale reform of copyright law. Or another option is you do a kind of a addition to fair dealing, you give sort of more fair use exemptions um, under, uh, under European law, um, under, your, uh, under a European copyright directive. Um, the UK has actually moved quite quickly, and Ireland is kind of following um, on that in the sense of moving in and introdu introducing new fair use exemptions, which allow for what we describe, um, what you describe as data mining, which we, which we describe as textual, textual and data mining or content mining. And that's only, though, in a non-commercial context. So 
we understand, I think, in Europe that we need to move, we need to catch up a little bit in terms of how non-personal data analytics works, um, but we're still not quite there yet. Well, so I think the other thing is interesting about um, unexpected or um, surprising results from the mm. data sets are that the primary purpose of most of your true big data analytics are the unexpected results. The, the whole reason is to look for correlations amongst the data sets and make decisions based on that. Um, and so I'll, I'll take a little side trip that we all, and this is something I'll repeat again and again and again, ice cream does not cause summer. Shocking. This is a moment, everyone. Ice cream does not cause summer. A lot of your business teams want to do this parallel processing um, and, and look at these analytic sets and do the data mining to come up with these conclusions about what customers want, how to deliver services, what the next big thing is, and what they're finding are correlations and not necessarily causality. So if you stick to the, the correlation and you report the results in that way rather than targeting an individual, that puts you in a different mm -hmm. data protection yeah. uh, posture. And then um, if you're documenting the, the fact that you are doing either research-based analytics and your provider is, an, is a university versus, say, a Blue Chi or an Axiom or, or one of these other mm -hmm. data warehouses, that puts your company into a very different risk posture. So remembering that most decisions can be made based on correlations and not causality, and this is where I think a lot of your marketing teams in particular are, usually, are the usual culprits. And sometimes when you're looking at risk analytics in the security realm, uh, where, I, where I work and play, um, as well, where you really have to separate what is the point of the processing in the first place? Is it for a correlation? Is it for causation? What is going to be the impact and the result? And that's more of a US-centric, harm-based kind of schematic. But before you even start that processing, when you're designing what your purpose statements are, so that you're creating a contextual purpose statement um, for your users. I think that's a much more international way of approaching um, how to actually practically and pragmatically handle big data. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think that, that that's the approach that sort of allows you to have the harm-based um, assessment, which is what, the, what my understanding of the US approach is, um, rather than just a rights-based assessment, which is what the European uh, perspective will ask of you. Um, I mean, I think it's useful to think about this as well in the context of um, Again, Article 29 guidance around anonymization. So they ask anonymization or ask of anonymization in a, perhaps a different way um, than you might see in the, on, on the US side. Uh, they don't consider uh, anonymization in the same way. They don't consider it as being as acceptable. They don't consider it to disapply European data protection rules. Um, they ask in the context of anonymization a very simple test. Um, if you have a motivated intruder, if you have somebody who can, through, you know, through reasonable skill but not too much specialist skill, um, re-identify the information, so then the Data Protection Act is still going to apply, Data Protection Directive is still going to be applicable, and in that context, you have a challenge. And the motivated intruder isn't necessarily a star hacker. It, it is a, it's an investigative journalist. Exactly, yes. Well, um, I'm actually curious about sort of big data and sort of these broader purposes because, I mean, we've probably read articles where uh, websites are serving up sort of airline fares and hotel bookings based upon what they know about you. So if you have a Mac, they have data which shows that uh, Mac users tend to spend more on hotels. So then they'll serve you up sort of a fare, a hotel um, rate that's higher, $100 higher than a PC user. Or, I mean, so I'm just saying, I'm not making that Macs. up, by the way. That was, in the, <laughs> that was in the Wall Street Journal. Google that. But, um, so, which is, you know, alarming, and we know that there's sort of geo-targeting offline, right? So the price that you pay at Safeway in one state may be different. We're okay with that. But sort of pinpointing sort of my IP address and my, um, all that, you know, information you can gather about me as a particular user, and then using that to foist, you know, higher fares on me. So how do you explain that? Because I think marketers aren't just happy with sort of trends and correlations. They want to be able to serve up real-time information for you, which I think is the holy grail of what, you know, successful marketers are trying to deliver and what the marketplace is rewarded. What do you think? Well, so I'll start with the Mac example. I, it's, a, it's an interesting one because that there again is a correlation and not a causation. So they don't actually have to know anything about you. They just know that you have in the past purchased a Mac product or you're, you're broadcasting what you're working on from a Mac product. And that, that should be an anonymous transaction. They don't really need to know more than that if they have this. Now, 
you know, query whether there's a price discrimination issue. If you add enough of those data elements together, you know, are you violating the Fair Credit Reporting Act and, uh, and other? So Lydia says no. <laughs> Lydia says no. So we have a call on the play. Just, uh, I don't know the answer, and she does. Lydia, we're going to invite does. you to talk about this in a minute. Um, so I don't think we're there yet, and Lydia says we're not, so I, I agree with Lydia because she's much smarter than I am. But I think that's, this is where we're, we're, um, we're the, there's a myth around data and a reality around data. And if we're just correlating with actual behavior, I actually think it's a boon to privacy overall. Because, so this is the next thing. But if you click five times and you keep coming back for like an airline fare, they, they jack it up because they know you're ready to buy. So yeah, I don't know if it gets to feel a little So now you, so you've changed the hypothetical on us, <laughs> Ms. Skiles. <laughs> so Told you, this is senior, under, senior under level that seminar. fact pattern, you're starting to get more and more where you actually are using tracking and behavioral data that is targeting an individual to make a price differentiation. So we, we have heard that. I don't know how, uh, you know, I don't run a, a travel site. Actually, Kathy's here somewhere. It, but I've heard that you delete your cookies before you go back again. Yep. So see, we have, this is excellent. <laughs> this is like a reverse inside out panel. This is like big data panel where we actually don't know anything. You guys can just try this. <laughs> Educate me, panel. I like it. Self-help. What Self would Europe say about that? Can you? Well, I, I could talk about it from the European cookie law perspective, which I think was an interesting, um, an interesting in the sense of, I think, failed um, initiative by uh, the European Commission too try to control that very issue or that very problem from their perspective in terms of their sense that there was an overuse of cookies and an overuse of that kind of analytics. These cookies were a fail too, by well, the way. Whoever bakes today. <laughs> but no, um, Pixelate them. Two failed, two failed cookie initiatives. So, but effectively, uh, the European Commission had introduced this rule and it hasn't been adopted. I mean, uh, one of the things that they want to do with, this, with the Harmonized Directive is to have a universal set of rules uh, which apply equally across uh, all the member states. Um, but I mean, if they look back at the directive which was associated with cookies, it hasn't been applied uh, universally. I mean, the, the rules in, on the continent are, are, are materially different. Uh, the UK regulator, the ICO, who's very sensible um, in general, they had a rule about opt-in. They changed the rule from opt-in two days after they launched into opt-out because they knew it just was not going to work. It was not a practical, pragmatic way to address uh, business in, the, in, in, in a current context. So from my perspective, from a European perspective, cookies has been very interesting to watch. A, slow regulatory action, B, a kind of reluctant regulatory action, and C, sort of common sense creeping in where the Irish and the UK regulator have sort of said, actually, on balance, we're not too sure that this, A, matters that much, and B, that we're going to be able to do much business. And I know the Irish regulators here, you're probably going to radically disagree with what I'm saying in terms of it not mattering. Um, but I think that was the end result, where they said, well, actually, let's have a look to see how well this might work, and let's give it a shot. And actually, it doesn't work. It doesn't work that well, so let's go for a baseline level of compliance. But more, more important, over and above that, how important is this actually? How, how, you know, how intrusive are, are, are cookies? Um, and the end result was that in general, session cookies are not deemed to be intrusive, but pers persistent cookies are deemed to be intrusive. So you get a kind of complicated outcome, which the legislation doesn't necessarily prepare the, uh, the consumer for. That might take us to uh, the next uh, point, which was the one-stop shop. Uh, yeah, I think, but I'd suggest in the context of, of big data from a European perspective, right, if we're going to accept the proposition, um, and I think it's a slightly unfortunate proposition that the proposed general data protection regulation is going to apply very, very broadly, and it's going to apply in circumstances which would be somewhat surprising. So you're going to say, well, actually, I didn't quite think that was personal data. Uh, the example uh, might be IP addresses a couple of years ago in Europe was a general sense that these are not, this is not personal data. The general consensus in Europe is it is now personal data. I think it depends very much whether it's a static or dynamic address, clearly. But the point is that there's shifting sands in terms of what's deemed to be personal data at any point in time. The general data protection regulation or the proposed regulation is interesting in that it, it tries to be a one-size-fits-all. It tries to address a, no, a whole range of issues, um, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Um, I'll give an example of something which I think is largely unsuccessful, and that's data portability. Data portability has very little to do with uh, general data protection. It's about moving data from one controller, if you like, to another. The fact that, the per that it's personal data is, uh, is frankly an aside in, in, in that context. And there is probably another context in which that is better managed. Um, however, if you are going to be in a situation where you're going to see data protection rules apply broadly to any kind of data processing you're doing, or most kinds of data processing, whether it involves personal data or not, 
I think the one-stop shop is going to be a very important, if somewhat controversial, element of the proposed regulation. So for those who don't know, the one-stop shop is effectively a mechanism whereby you will be able to choose your regulator. You'll be able to decide who is the most appropriate European supervisory authority for you. Um, now, it's venue shopping. It's venue shopping or forum shopping to a certain extent. Um, and as a result of that, it's been the most contentious part of the discussions around this regulation. And, and frankly, for anybody who's been following this, it's been going on for a considerable period of time now, to the point where some of our clients don't believe us anymore that's going to happen. Uh, because <laughs> it's coming. It's been years um, in the making. But this has become the most, the most controversial, controversial aspect of it. And that's because is a sense of ceding sovereignty on the part of some of the European states. Um, but from a business perspective, and keeping this very practical, it's very important for you to pick a regulator that you can do business with. Um, and I'm not suggesting you can't do business with all the regulators, but it's easier to do business with some rather than others. Um, and that is on the basis of, of two things, not just them being business friendly, but their understanding of the nature of the business that you're engaged in. And I think some of the European regulators have been a lot better at understanding and taking time to understand than others. Spend some tales about that, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Tell us about your favorite Maybe regulator. Oh my favorite. If I want to do business, where should I go? You know, the FTC, of course. <laughs> and Billy Hawks, if he's in the room, definitely, for sure. Um, so it's interesting, and, and I think um, part of it too is is kind of the ugly American syndrome, right? I mean, we have a lot of people here who are are monolingual. And so you're going to gravitate toward the culture and the language that, that is easiest for you to understand and cheaper for you to deal with. Um, so you're going to see a natural gravitation to the UK um, and Ireland, um, for sure. I mean, you're not going to see a lot of people running to Spain, um, where they have a, a, you know, a self-funded regulatory schema. Now, mind you, if you did, that, that's, a, that's kind of a level of bravado that probably uh, sends a signal. I, sus I suspect after the, uh, the recent Right to be Forgotten decision, no one's going to go to Spain. Uh, on, on this. But we'll maybe I'm we'll get there yeah. for sure. Uh, probably, but I think, uh, I think the other thing is, too, is, and again, this is a very, this whole panel is styled to be as pragmatic as possible. There's a lot of theory we can talk about it during the cocktail hour. But what you really want to do as a, as a pragmatic matter is where's your data, where are your people, where's your business? So we look at where our, the bulk of our customers are. Where, where do we really make sure we're delighting our customers, enterprise, and B2C, and, and B2G? Um, where are our data centers? Where is, it, where is it most important, and where are we capable of having enough people and staff and expertise to actually protect our, our data under the security requirements under both the cybersecurity directive as well as the, mm -hmm. the impending any moment regulation? Any year. <laughs> any year now. And then where are your people? So if you, de if you have a mass corpus of people in Germany, that may be where you're going to go because you're going to be effectively governed by the works councils in any event. And so you may want to start in that jurisdiction. So that's, that's really how I look across, mm. um, you know, if I was to pick my regulator uh, based on where you want to do business. What about um, the laws that tend to be most permissive or less restrictive? I think there's a, there's a sort I of... Think um, our, our audience may have sort of commissioned, you know, country by country analyses that cost many, many, many dollars and give you really fat binders from outside counsel and then they go away. Um, and then you actually have to do something and tell your business what to do. So well, um, do I still have to do that? Well, I think you do have to do that to a certain extent. And I clearly have a particular bias. Okay, and that's, that's obvious from, 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 uh, from where I've come from and from my, from, from my background. But nevertheless, I don't think that means that Ireland's always right for you. It means that Ireland may be right for you in the circumstances. The UK may, in other circumstances, be right for you. France may be perfect for you in other circumstances. It depends. And I think that's the, that's, that's the point, is that the analysis that you're suggesting should be undertaken is an important analysis to undertake. But I think the, the, the important thing, is to, particularly in terms of what's coming down the line, is to decide, where is my point of main establishment? Where is going to be my headquarters? It's almost akin to a tax analogy or a tax analysis. Where, am I, where, is, where is my decisions going to be taken from a data protection perspective? And we'll come on to if your decisions are not taken within Europe later on, because there's some implications from some, some of the recent case law about that as well. But that is probably the key first, first step. And having taken that step then, everything sort of flows from that in terms of what rules you're going to follow and, and you know, what, what obligations you're going, to, you're going to meet. But there isn't one size fits all. There may be a one-stop shop eventually, but there is not one size fits all. And there is a degree of rigor and analysis required in order to determine which is the right jurisdiction for you. Well, I think the other, the other thing in my mind that's going on right now is, is um, we do talk a lot about Europe. 
obviously, um, but there are Canadian, the new can spam law in Canada is quite strict. What's going on in South Korea is quite wild, to say the least. Japan has very, very strong and strict consumer protection laws and privacy. So you really want to take, um, you know, you want to take the analysis that you can, take a reasonable amount, not the case book that, uh, you know, has barely had, you know, you know, client swapped out for the word McAfee, and, and you know, we get this giant thing that's not helpful. But you want to kind of took it, look at this in toto, and then do your board presentation. At the end of the day, you want your executive staff to be able to, to stand and deliver. And sometimes it's, it's a tax call, and the tax yep. liabilities are so great that it doesn't matter what your data protection story is going to be like. You're going to pay whatever you're going to pay, and by gosh, you're going to be in Luxembourg. And, and that's just how the cards are going to fall. Mm. So, so you really take this in, and I think this is this is the um, I'm hoping trend. I think during the recession, everybody had to be a lawyer and a technical person and a business person to be a privacy officer. And I think we actually lost some ground as executives. I think the new way I'm hoping to see us push forward is really leading forward as business executives taking risk-based decisions, and and they do involve risk. You really shouldn't be sitting behind your desk saying, well, Germany's hard and Spain, you know, enjoy the tapas, you're going to be there a lot. You know, really want to come forward with, this is the analysis I've taken, I've talked to all my cohorts, and this is my recommendation uh, going forward on a risk-based um, account. And then, inevitably, you will have pushback, you will have cases that come up in each of these jurisdictions, and, and, and then you still are able to be very stable in your practice. Because mm. the worst thing to happen is, you know, the first little blip that happens, the, the CPO gets the objector seat and they put someone in there and guess what? We make no progress as, yeah. as a community. Right. Yeah. Well, when you get the midnight call where your general manager in Il Italy is about to be locked up, um, <laughs> that tends to sort of Depends change. Depends how much I like them. Yes, because I've actually, <laughs> oh, is that my outside voice? <laughs> Had that, but seriously, um, no. I've worked at companies with clients where literally someone is getting ready to be thrown in jail, or the threat of jail is impending, and people are not banging at the door and they're calling headquarters in the U.S. saying, "What do I do?" And so I think that I mean the tax decisions have to be made, but sort of criminal penalties and jail time and being in the newspaper—that's another element too. That I guess um, can sort of you have this master plan, and then all of a sudden you're starting to get adverse decisions and fines and things. And so then, how do you revisit that? Well, it's a great question. I think there's a lot of Valley companies, certainly, that have suffered under that that mantle, where the the brand becomes so heavy under the weight of this, this the bad reputation for privacy that even when you do good things like writing good and clear privacy policies, you're you're going to be regulated out of out of the box. That's true. Yep. Um, so you know, again, I think it is staying. If you if you look at this as a legal compliance field, you will fail. You, you will survive for a little while, and maybe you'll have lots of jobs at a lot of different firms, but in the, in the end, this is an emerging economy of data, and you need to look at it as an economist, you need to look at it as a lawyer, you need to look at it as a technologist. And it stinks that we, we have to be so uh, broad in our scope of risk assessment, but that is the reality of, you know, if you want this job, and it's a fantastic job, that's the job. It's not filling out vendor agreements or even data transfer agreements. That's the job, protecting data about human beings. Well, I think your job's about to get a little bit easier. Uh, <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, I do. I'm very I, tired. I, I, Look I, at me. I'll tell, you, <laughs> I'll tell you why I think it's about to get a little bit easier. Um, it's because I think there's been a misconception, overplayed, that the rules between Europe and the US are, are, are distinctly different. The fundamentals That's are true. not that different. I mean, you, I'm sure, see that every day. It's yep. just not that different. Um, once you have... In fact, there's probably greater differences sometimes within the, the EU than there is between, say, some of the European jurisdictions and, and, and the US. Um, what, you, what you're going to see, I think, once this proposed regulation eventually claws its way uh, over the line is a set of harmonized rules across Europe. I mean, the, the same rules will apply. And those rules are not going to look all that different to what you'd be fairly used to in, uh, in the US perspective. So, for example, the EU have taken on board some of the things which work very well here, data breach fining laws, for example, data breach notification obligations, that, that kind of thing is going to be very front and center. Now, the way it's going to be done in the proposed regulation, I wouldn't necessarily be uh, jumping up and down and waving flags in favor of, but nevertheless, it is there. Again, the idea of enforcement through fining and the enforcement through sort of settlements, that kind of thing is also a, a positive, a positive potential. 
uh, elements as well. And, and even more, on a more kind of conceptual level, the idea of accountability, um, that you have accountability as a daily controller, and that manifests itself in some concrete ways. It's something which I think you'd be probably quite used to from a US perspective as well. So I think your job is about to get perhaps broader um, in some ways. Um, and I take your point on entirely in terms of a range of different perspectives and a range of different kind of knowledge. Um, but I don't think that the, I think in a globalized context, I think we're moving towards a more uniform approach. Yeah, so it's a good question. So I'll repeat it for the room. Um, you know, basically, what are we doing if we're doing anything different at all on the? And I'll, I'll start with the notices for big data processing, and we'll move into kind of the what are we actually doing. So I think the the prior discussion is really the backdrop to that is how are we preparing preparing the overall program? The 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 privacy policies and notices for big data are very interesting to me because I think again. A lot of the real, well, it depends on the business, number one. So I'm going to give general statements. These are not McAfee statements. These are general statements about the marketplace. But I think big data um, that is truly targeting an individual is much more the realm of the data brokers, which are all being held into account right now by the FTC. They, they're all kind of under the, the microscope. So I can't speak to how all of that is going down in the future. I think for most companies, you're really not um, taking information from these large data sets and really processing them in a very personalized way yet. So I don't think that it's a crisis of, of notice at this point. What I do think it is, is I think all the businesses are starting to figure out what are these big data analytics that are being sold to our marketers, for example, and through HR and all these other services, and then you know how are we productizing or consumerizing um, this stuff. So the approach that we're taking is a privacy engineering approach, which should not, shouldn't be a surprise. Um, and that is to really build in understanding what is the metadata that is being used in any of these analytics. So whether it's, it's a Hadoop parallel processing situation, whether it's an outsourcer by a third party, uh, whether it's an on-prem large data set that we actually own and have proprietary interest in. What we do is we break it down into um, a series of models so that we say at the, in, at the point of input, what is the information that's being collected and what is the modality? Are you buying it, renting it, storing it, asking for it? And then we figure out what's that data. This is where the big data input sets come in. Are you buying a data set or an analytic to add to that stack? And, and so this, is, this comes into the privacy impact assessment route, really, when you're putting together a new product based on data in particular. Um, so I think we're still at that kind of architectural stage of what are the inputs, what is the life cycle, how do we get rid of it if we want it? And the nice thing about big data is oftentimes all you need to make and take a decision is the input analytic. You don't need the backup data. So that's a nice thing because a lot of times it is the backup data that is the personally identifiable data. And when you correlate it down into a uh, kind of a federated score, if you will, which is what a lot of these analytics are, they say, you know, is, is she a Mac user, is she not? Or is, is individual X on this device, yes or no? So I think that schema still falls on to the, under the notices that we have today, but I think it's, you know, to, to the point I know you're, you're getting to is how do we actually say, who are the big data processors? How do we know what are the big, the big uh, analytic sets? I haven't seen any privacy policies that are really doing specific big data set processor disclosures yet, but I think the field is still new. So you know, from, from where I sit, it still is an architectural and a business discussion of, you know, is it, it's, it's kind of being treated as a quasi outsourcing. So if this is a data set, where I have fiduciary control over any of the data, all of my processes and procedures for vendors and outsourcers apply. 
if instead it is someone else's proprietary data set. So you buy a McAfee product and I give you a proprietary score or I tell you that this thing is a piece of malware. You're not getting any of the background data that we've already processed. You're just getting the blocking, you know, the DAT file that's black blocking. So you, as the person using my services, wouldn't necessarily have to disclose beyond that you use outside companies to help protect your site. You wouldn't have to, I don't think, say I'm using specific vendors specifically to find DAT files in this context. I just don't think we're that granular yet. I don't know if that makes sense or if that's too in the weeds. Yeah, I think the data brokers are going to supply a steady diet for a while because they actually do have a ton of personalized information and they've been processing it for a very, very long time. It's a very complex business. So to the extent that we could add to our notice that we're using uh, Blue Kai or any of the other vendors, I don't know that it adds enough information to our end user to actually make it useful or helpful to them. So that's that's the conundrum I have is, you know, there's every policy is dual fold, one to educate and one to protect company and the consumer. Um, so I, I haven't seen, and, and maybe Paul and you've, you've yeah. written or seen more that are more helpful. No, what I, I mean, what I would suggest from, a, from the European perspective is that you talked about a crisis of notice. I think we're probably, if the regulation passes in its current form, or anything like its current form, so there's a kind of a version from March 2014, you're going to see a crisis of, cons of consent, because that everything is focused around consent. And for example, there is one exemption uh, for processing, which is which permits processing in the context of scientific or technical research. That's been peeled right back. It's been peeled right back to the extent that a lot of the universities, I know this because one of the Irish ones that we, we act for has, has been engaged in this, have been lobbying very hard to try and have that exemption um, reworked and, and, and effectively put back into what the original commission suggestion was from 2012. So the reason why I think we're facing into some sort of crisis of consent is because that's the baseline then. That's the baseline fully informed consent. You need to have a notice or some sort of privacy policy privacy statement which is telling you at the outset at collection exactly how the data might be used in every single conceivable reasonably conceivable way and that's a big challenge I think So, so this is, it, it shows you like we, we have a lot of good fallback stuff. So, so remember, so Eileen and I worked together back in the day of Outsource Palooza. So when, when we all started outsourcing, this, those issues came up then. So it's kind of like dusting off all of, you know, when, when you get a call from a regulator, you want to pull out the binder and the binder says, here's the training that we gave every person. Here's the required stuff that they had to do. Here's the pen testing that we've done. Here's the tabletop review. Every now and again, you're still going to get someone who took a screenshot or forgot to log out when they were doing a shared session of support. 
But if you have those documented policies and procedures in place, then you're at least one step ahead of the game because it is systemic. And then it, that trickles down into your contracts that you that you have with your vendors that are under either the Article 17 or, yeah. or the cybersecurity directives. And you try to have that consistent level. You have to have that consistent level if you're going to be processing European data in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think where some of this gets very interesting to me is where you have a, a, a geography like Australia, for example, where employees are actually not covered, so only commercial data. And so you're... Australian entity will say, well, wait a minute, I don't have to do any of this Why for employee you data. <laughs> yeah, don't tread on me. I'm in Australia. Have you seen the size of our spiders? <laughs> I can take that from, just, well, from a yeah. European perspective. Um, this would be kind of surprising. It's actually probably permissible now uh, because there's been a case in the last two months um, around this. So this will sort of take a step back for a moment. There's an Irish um, airline. It's a big European airline, Ryanair. Um, they have actively um, sought um, at a European level to stop screen scraping over the last two to three years. Um, and initially, they were kind of successful. So they got kind of some injunctive relief to begin with um, in Ireland and the UK. And that began to kind of take, uh, take the began to gain some momentum, because they had a big problem with screen scraping in terms of uh, uh, ticket prices and the like. And I think some of the US cases involved airlines as well. So uh, initial success, followed then by um, some setbacks um, in terms of uh, the Spanish courts, where in a case called eDreams, the Spanish court said, well, that's the price you pay for doing business on the internet, which is a slightly funny way of uh, re reaching that, that a conclusion. But nevertheless, that's, that, that's where they came. Um, and they, they tried to deploy a range of different um, mechanisms to try and stop the screen scraping from relying upon database rights, from relying on copyright, from relying upon passing off. Um, and ultimately, um, they just could not get a uniform approach. So where they ended up going was to the German Supreme Court. And they went to the German Supreme Court on the basis of um, unfair commercial practices, or what's described as unfair competition, but it's not unfair competition in the kind of antitrust sense. Um, and they were ultimately unsuccessful. Uh, the court said, no, uh, this screen scraping is permissible. Um, your website T's and C's, for example, don't apply uh, to, the, to the screen scraper. They apply to your normal users, which is a sort of a, an unfortunate thing, which they might be able to fix. But basically, no, uh, screen scraping is permissible. Now, the court did also make one additional finding, which is interesting. It said, had there been a sufficiently robust technical barrier to prevent uh, screen scraping, well, then our decision might be slightly different. And they also referred the case back to the local German court and said, um, you need to think about whether there's a consumer rights issue here, whether the consumers are being in some way misled um, by the manner in which the, uh, the, 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 the site is operating. But the screen scraping per se is permissible. Um, and that's been kind of significant case because it's the one company who's kind of gone after this most unrelentingly um, in Europe. Just what, what's the name of the it's Cheap Tickets uh, versus Reiner. Yeah, when we were discussing the, this issue on the panel, we talked about sort of um, the older cases, which were sort of the airline cases here in the States that started off with the screen scraping. So you had Fair Chase and American Airlines and Southwest. Remember all of those cases from the, the early 2000s? Um, and eventually it just ceased, right? Um, it, a lot of it was negotiated. A lawsuit was filed. No great law was sort of made on it. Um, after that, then you sort of have the Facebook case where they prevailed, I think, on the copyright grounds primarily. Um, but, you know, I always think back to sort of Bitter's Edge and those cases where it was all about your toss. So, you know, trespass to chattel and all these weird, like, 18th century concepts about, you know, coming on my site and taking my stuff. So it was very, <laughs> and it, it seemed to have sort of like, you know, a, pretty nice story that the judges could sort of write, like you were on this property, you were not invited, you were told to go away electronically, you came back. Um, and so, you know, I don't know in terms of sort of like, you know, how pernicious it is in terms of the scraping and how methodical it can be. I guess LinkedIn is having that issue now with suing sort of scrapers. Uh, the question raised a lot of times is, well, if, 
if it's a social media site, even if it's behind a wall, if you put your information out there for public consumption and someone scrapes it, then the, then the site that sort of made that service available somehow um, is going to assert rights in your data. So I think it's all um, pretty interesting from the scraping standpoint. But clearly, there's sort of like room to grow in this from a scraping standpoint as a business strategy, correct? Because So after 50 pages, was it a yes or a no? It's a bad answer. <laughs> no, it'll cost you. But um, so yeah, I just think you know, I think if you pick the wrong mark, um, you could, you know, find yourself like on the other end of a very sort of vigorous litigation. Um, but I think a lot of times it's just, you know, once you put up sort of your instructions on your website saying don't do this, um, you would generally counsel clients not to continue to do that because it is, um, I think, you, you know, folks have figured out how to sort of beef up their toss, their terms of service and T's and C's to make it clear that it's not just consumer facing, it's, it's also sort of hackers and uh, crackers and malware folks and all these other people out there. But yeah, I think those cases are probably going to be resurrected now. Uh, I'm interested, and I'm, I'm really thinking about the financial angle now about like stock I don't know, stock prices and a bunch of other things that might be out there. Um, let's see, we only have a few more minutes. We had some other topics, but I don't know what's interesting enough to you, whether you sort of, we, you prefer that we open it up to you, like we had other uh, topics we were going to discuss, like th the right to be forgotten, California's eraser law, uh, NSA and Snowden, Grown. So, um, you know, I think, you know, unless we hear any objections, we'll just move on to sort of the other topics, unless we have questions. Well, it makes a difference. Yeah, no, it's under the current law, uh, it probably makes some difference at the moment because uh, remember the processing that was being undertaken was, pro was undertaken with it outside of the EU. It was undertaken effectively by Google Inc. in sitting in California. Uh, it didn't, well, it didn't help, but had the processing been undertaken in Ireland, for example, there may have been an argument to say, well, actually, Spain is not the right place. It's not the right location. Ireland is the correct location within Europe. What's interesting about the Google case, and this is genuinely a departure, it's that the first, it's, they've actually said, well, actually, you know, the fact that the processing took place outside of Europe makes you subject to European data protection rules. You're a controller, you're established, you need to exercise the right to be forgotten, or as I like to call it, the right to be de-indexed, you know? That, that's effectively what, what, what was said. The focus was never on the processing which was being undertaken by Google in Dublin, because that was just, just wasn't relevant. I think it would have been a lot more interesting uh, as an issue if somebody had said, well, mm -hmm. let's look at the processing which is undertaken in Spain or Barcelona, um, versus the processing which is undertaken in Dublin, Ireland. And actually, in that context, which one is the main establishment? And that's the very driver for the one-stop shop, because we can't have that ongoing ambiguity in terms of who has jurisdiction or have multi-supervisory jurisdiction, because it won't work. But even, in the, in, even if you have a lead regulator, it doesn't mean that the other country laws don't apply. No. They're just your lead regulator and help you interpret and help you navigate. Yeah, exactly. I mean, under the, under the proposal, right, there's going to be a mechanism where you'll have a silence procedure where one of the regulators put their hand up and say, actually, I just don't like this. This, is, this, this, this decision is fundamentally a problem for me from, I don't know, a constitutional perspective. Um, so there's not going to be a situation where it's just one main establishment or supervisory authority going out on their own and making a decision. It's going to be a kind of a consultation or a committee. But one, one has to take the lead. Otherwise, what's the point in reforming the law? Should we sketch out the right to be forgotten? Yeah, yeah well... <laughs> The right to be forgotten. The right to be forgotten has been controversial for some period of time. Um, uh, and frankly, possibly the right to be forgotten, as it's proposed in the regulation, is a little bit more sensible to, than, than, than what effectively came through the uh, ECJ decision. But the problem is you had to wait a long time for, that East, for, 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 the, for the regulation to be kind of make, its, make, its, make its way um, along. And the case law kind of caught up and overtook it. Um, so does everybody know the facts of that particular case? People are generally familiar with it. Um, assuming that's the case, there's three interesting things coming out of it. The first thing is the idea, as we just discussed, that because you were processing uh, 
uh, through a sales center um, in um, in Spain. Uh, the fact that, that you know you are now subject to European data protection law that's a surprise. It's a surprise for two reasons: a, it's not what you would typically interpret the directive to mean, um, and secondly, it's a surprise because the advocate general, the person who makes a kind of a predetermination um, in these decisions um, for, for ECJ decisions, uh, found that in fact that wasn't the position at all. That, uh, that, that 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 there wasn't a sort of an establishment in Spain in that context. The second thing uh, which is interesting about it is the determination of Google are a data controller. Google, as I understand it, um, have resisted. The, the determination that they are a data controller in that context for a long period of time. Um, and indeed, the Advocate General again found um, in their favor. So that's a kind of surprising development. It does mean that if you're selling into Europe, if you're engaged in a significant degree of processing of European residents or European nationals' data, well, then you've potentially got that sort of extra jurisdictional reach on, on, on the part of Europe. Um, and the third, perhaps most significant and, and certainly most commented aspect is this now right to be forgotten. Um, the reason I say I, th I think the proposal in the regulation was more sensible because that was actually looking at where the data was stored. It was going to the newspaper and asking the newspaper to take responsibility for takedown. Um, and uh, you know, it was looking at the source and saying, you're the source, you may have disseminated, it's your responsibility. This is saying to an independent search company, um, I know it does a lot more than just search, but a search company in this context, you have a responsibility. And not only that, depending on how you read the judgment, it's your, it, it, it's your responsibility to make the balance, to make the call in terms of what should be kept up and what should be taken down. And I'm not so sure that Google A want that job or, or, or our best place to do it. So it's an unfortunate decision resulting, I think, from the case law kind of having under, you know, overtaken um, the, uh, the, the, the proposed change in law. Um, and the proposed change in law has been very controversial, but you know, there, is some, there is some logic to it, um, uh, although I'm not sure uh, you necessarily fully agree with me. No, I don't, yeah. I don't agree with you. <laughs> So this this is Michelle's theme. This is my thing. No, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be <laughs> somewhat calm about it because I could be very controversial. So um, the right to be forgotten, based on an Israeli professor who came out with a book called The Right to Be Forgotten, on the false premise that there used to be a time when we used to forget stuff. Well, I grew up in a 1900 person town and nobody forgot nothing <laughs> ever. <laughs> That's why we all moved and went away. Um, <laughs> depending how naughty we were, um, but in, in all seriousness, I think I think the issue that was attempted to be addressed by this right to be forgotten is is twofold. One is foolish photographs and, and, and youthful indiscretions. Uh, fair enough, you you should have a right to mature and move on. Um, and then the other is is context. So without a date on a piece of content. Everything looks fresh and new, and it, you could have one position and then never ever get off of it again, or change your mind, or move on, or you know the dialogue will never progress. And those are very important issues, and I think issues that need to be debated by philosophers and students and playwrights and and George Orwell again um, before we concoct a law. And and part of my my outrage with this with this law as it stands or as it is proposed is. You know, not really my day job. I can deal with it as my day job, but you know, my nights and weekend job is as an advocate for children and, and elderly people and people who really are are disenfranchised. And so uh, we'll we'll get very dark very fast. So when when a woman is is raped, usually there's a rape shield law, and to prevent her name from gaining too much publicity because of all the nev negative um, impact, you know, the, the the history of misogyny of she was asking for it we take her name out of the paper. For a woman to actually exercise the right to be forgotten, her name must be in the paper to actually submit the claim. So basically we're setting up a situation where her rapist has every right to erase his wrongdoing after he's served his time, you know, assuming he's caught and assuming there's been publicity around it, true factual publicity. He is allowed to ask Google here in the US to take down that record. She is, vic she is victimized again. She has no right to erase this crime. She can watch her perpetrator saying, I got this right to take it down. I mean, look at this debtor in Spain. Everyone knows who he is, and he didn't pay his bill 16 years ago. We all know his business now. So I, I, that worries me very, very much, because there are children, there are women, there are people who are the victims of burglary who will have their burglars able to get rid of their criminal record, maybe even before the insurance company has paid out. So I think we haven't really thought through the societal impact of erasing human history. And I think it's so ironic that a, 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 
Mountain View based company is allowed to now re index European history. It's so crazy to me the impact, the actual pragmatic impact they are getting. And God bless Google, they put up a form. They said, Do you want to take down? Great. They're getting seven requests per second. So what happens when there's seven requests per second? Do you think there's any thoughtful adjudication of these records? No way. It's going to be the ultimate in big data processing. They can't handle it. And they were required, not suggested, they were required to do it. So I think it's, it is everything that's wrong with no context, no big data. If you want to solve the problem of photograph takedown on a social media site, make that the law. But to have this blanket right that hurt so many disenfranchised people, so many voiceless people, so many people who deserve to have a record of true and honest facts. Now, if they're not true and honest facts, we have the law of defamation to protect us. So I get that side of it, too. I'm not saying it's not a bad thing, but I just say I don't think we're ready for it. And um, that's my soapbox, and I'm standing on it. Yeah, we're <laughs> wrapping up. But before we go, since she would not, I shall. We have the Privacy Engineers Manifesto. Um, this is a book written by Michelle and her colleague Jonathan Fox and her father, who's a lawyer and an engineer and architect, right? Yeah, what does he not do? So um, <laughs> this was, um, if we weren't pragmatic and practical enough, then this will get you there because there are lots of Venn diagrams and circles and arrows and things that just make me go, ugh. Um, but anyway, it's a great book, and um, I'm, I'm such a pleasure to have you on the panel as well as your and colleagues. you can get it for free, yeah.com or Kindle or Duck. You can get it for free and share it with your colleagues. Yes, free download. Free download. Yeah, or you can pay for the paper, please. And she will sign it. So anyway, thank you all. We really appreciate it. Okay. <laughs>